Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing Philip Grandine, the pastor who may or may not have murdered his pregnant wife, Anna Carissa Grandine. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before we get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And if you are not familiar with Dossier, don't you worry, you're about to get familiar with Dossier. Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents, but at a fraction of the luxury price point, where most luxury perfumes can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars. First off, how dare they? Dossier's perfumes range anywhere from $29 to $49, and they offer bulk deals with up to 25% off and also free shippings when you buy three or more bottles, which is a deal that sounds too good to be true, I know, but I promise you, it's actually not. <laughs> so I got two scents to share with you today. The first one I got here, oh my gosh, it's one that I've gotten many, many times. This is Citrus Green Apple, which is inspired by Dolce & Gabbana's Light Blue Perfume, which I've never had that one, but I've had this one a number of times. This is a fan favorite. It's one that I've gotten over and over again. It's one of my favorites. It's my mom's favorite. It's my sister's favorite. Like this just smells amazing and classic and wonderful. And the other scent I got is their scent Floral Violet, which is inspired by Marc Jacobs Daisy, which again, I've never tried that. And prior to this, I had never tried this. This is my first time getting Floral Violet. And oh my gosh, this might be one of my favorite ones I've ever gotten. It just smells so pretty but fresh and simple and not overpowering at all. Just something that I could really see wearing every day. Now, if wonderful scents isn't enough of a selling point for you when it comes to uh, perfume, which I mean, it probably is. Something that's great about Dossier to me and something that I always like sing the praises of is that they are a cruelty-free fragrance company and most luxury fragrance companies just simply are not. So if you love animals as much as I do, this is a perfect fit for you. And then of course there's the whole, um, them being a fraction of the price of the luxury counterparts anyway, which is already a humongous selling point. Now, if all that sounds as good to you as it does to me, I have great news. Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off their entire order. If they click the link in my description box and use the code Bratterstein at checkout. This code is good for a limited time, so make sure to jump on it while it's hot. And honestly, I don't think you're gonna find a better deal out there. They're already so affordable. Then you can use my coupon code that's 10% off. And then there's also like the free shipping deals and the bulk deals. I don't think you're gonna find a better deal out there. And you know, it's up to you, like live your life. But I think if you lived your life smelling lovely, you'd have a really good time. <laughs> so don't forget to click the link down in my description box and use the code Bratterstein at checkout to get 10% off your favorite new bottle of perfume or bottles of perfume today. And now I just want to say a big thank you to Dossier for sponsoring this video and partnering with me on so many videos throughout the last year, maybe two years at this point. Somebody go back and tell me because I can't even remember. It's been so long. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. All right, now that I'm done spreading the good word of Dossier, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now, this is a video on a case that I had actually never heard of before. I stumbled upon this case while I was scrolling on Facebook, as one does, and I found myself listening to a 911 call. And it immediately piqued my interest because this was Philip's 911 call. But actually, now that I think about it, this is a case out of Canada, so I don't think it's 911, is it? I heard his call to authorities when he found his wife dead in the family's bathtub. And as I dug deeper and deeper into this case, it got crazier and crazier from the alleged multiple times that Philip tried to poison his wife's smoothie before he actually was successful in killing her, allegedly, to the pastor's affair with one of his parishioners at church, to the multiple trials, the appeals. There's just so much to this case. So today I'm going to tell you the whole story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain while we go through all the details. But obviously I don't want you to answer until you have like some information to go on. But the question of the day is this. Do you believe that Philip Grandine is responsible for the death of his pregnant wife? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through all the details in this case. And now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of Philip Grandine, the pastor who may or may not have murdered his pregnant wife, Anna Carissa Grandine. Now I want to start this video off with a quote. It's a quote from the case, but it's also a question to you. And the question is this, 
If a pastor can betray you, who can you trust? Our story begins on October 17th, 2011, and it was on this day that emergency services received a call that led them to 12 March Road in Scarborough, Ontario, which is in Canada. The man on the other end of the line seemed frantic and just kept telling the operator that he needed help because his pregnant wife was under the water and wasn't breathing. The operator does everything they can to like give him instruction and try to keep him calm. They tell him to, you know, get her out of the bathtub and start performing CPR, but he says that he's too helpless and too in shock to administer CPR. And on top of that, every time he tries to like pick her up and pull her from the tub, she is like too slippery and too wet for him to actually remove her from the tub. When police arrive, they find that the scene doesn't look quite right to them. It isn't sitting, it's not computing, okay? Because not only did 25-year-old Philip Grandine, who was a nurse at this point, by the way, not perform any life-saving measures whatsoever, a nurse didn't do that, which is fine, people go into shock, but he didn't even drain the water out of the bathtub that she was in. So, because, not because of that, but, you know, kind of because of that, maybe because of that, allegedly because of that, His wife, Carissa Grandine, who was 29 years old and 20 weeks pregnant, had to be rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately she she did not survive and neither did the couple's unborn baby. Now, who were Philip and Carissa Grandine? Let's start with Carissa. Anna Carissa Darwin, who went by Carissa, was described as a beautiful person and a pure and gentle soul. Carissa was born in the Philippines and she was born on November 10th, 1981. And she was one of two daughters. Her and her sister, Hannah, were born to parents, Maria and Roman. Carissa and her family moved to Canada and settled in Toronto in 1994, where she worked extra jobs so that she could go to the University of Toronto. And there she went on to graduate in 2006 with an honors bachelor's of science in human biology and archaeology, and then went on to work for Berkeley Canada in downtown Toronto as a casualty underwriter. So she was killing it at school, she was killing it at work, and soon she was gonna be killing it at her love life because two years after she graduated college, she ended up marrying a man who she very much loved named Philip Grandine, effectively making her Carissa Grandine. Now, Philip Grandine was known as being confident and outgoing. He graduated um, as an Ontario scholar and won the Outstanding Boy Award from Paris District High School in 2004, and, prior, and that was prior to graduating, obviously. I kind of did that backwards for some reason. In 2003, when he was 17 years old, he was a runner-up in the Paris Fair Ambassador Competition, which I guess was like a big deal in Canada. If you're from Canada, let me know, because I saw that this is like a parade, a fair that's been going on for like 150 years. So for him to win this was like a pretty big deal. Philip had graduated from the seminary in 2007 with a bachelor's degree in theological studies, and then went on to become a pastor at the Ennerdale Road Baptist Church and an assistant pastor at the Park Lawn Baptist Baptist Church from 2008 to 2010. So all said, Philip seemed to be a pretty good match for Carissa specifically, because I didn't mention this yet, but Carissa loved God. Like she was a very um, like religious, God-fearing woman. That was a very important part of her life. Like she loved God so much that on her find a grave after she was murdered, it said that in lieu of donations to her, You can instead make donations directly to um, Jarvis Street Baptist Church or Child Evangelism Fellowship of Canada, and these could be made in Carissa's memory. In life, she was super active in several Baptist churches. She was seen as the, quote, true example of a saint. And one of these Baptist churches that she was super active in was the Ennerdale Road Baptist Church, which is where, you know, Philip was a pastor. And Carissa was super well-liked. She was super popular. She was seen as like an inspirational person to those that she knew and those that she went to church with because she had been battling like a long-term liver illness and she never let it get her down. She never complained. She was always happy and smiling and positive. And she was exactly the type of person who would have ever every reason to complain and think like this kind of sucks because living with a chronic illness is awful. So a God-fearing woman meets a God-fearing man who's literally a pastor, match made in heaven. Sounds pure, right? Except it's not, otherwise we wouldn't be here talking about it today. Anyways, the two went on to get married and they moved in together to a little bungalow in Scarborough, which a bungalow, by the way, which I did not know this, is a little house, like just a little house. I don't know why I thought that it was something else and I always just called a little house, a little house, but apparently like a single story house, a little single story house is a bungalow. But if you already knew that, I'm sorry for wasting your time. The two had been together three years when they found out that they were pregnant and they were expecting a new little baby. And this was super, 
super exciting, right? Carissa was so excited and so looking forward to being a mom. She was so excited to meet her little jelly bean. She called her baby her jelly bean, which wrecked my heart. Uh, to be honest with you and she was super excited because she was very close to learning the baby's gender She was actually just days away from learning that she was going to have a baby girl when she was killed And it's just so sad man because she was so excited about this and she never even got to find out the gender of her baby because she was She was killed. So now we're gonna get into when things started to not be so great. Okay, so they're married They've been together three years. They're pregnant with a little baby. Everything should be super great, right? Well, it would have been, except that Philip, Pastor Philip here, was having an affair with a 36-year-old woman named Eileen. Now, I did see in some reports they call her Elaine, but I saw it more often reported as Eileen, so I'm going to go with Eileen. And not only was Eileen friends with Philip and friends with Carissa, mind you, but she was a parishioner at his church where he was a pastor. And I don't know, I feel like God frowns upon that kind of thing, no? Now, it did not take Carissa long to find out about this. She actually found out about the affair in August of 2011, which was two months before she died. And not only did she find out that her husband was having an affair, which would have been super bad, but she also found out that he frequently was looking up prawn on the internet, which to me, I don't really care about that, but I know for some people, like, that's a big issue and that is considered cheating. So she finds out he's having an affair. She finds out he's looking up the prawn and she also finds out that he's online looking up escort services all the time like he was doing all kinds of stuff and she found out all of this can you even imagine like learning all that thinking that you're married to this sweet little pastor and it turns out he's a, a deviant okay so she finds out and she actually confronts him and she confronts eileen but this woman really is a true saint you know how they said she was a true example of a saint she clearly is because she forgave both of them when Philip first got caught, it seemed like he really wanted to fix things and stay with his wife. He even went as far as him and Carissa started meeting up with a friend of theirs, Pastor Stephen. Pastor Stephen. And this was a pastor at his church who him and Carissa had known like their whole relationship. They met him right before they got together or right before they got married. I forget which. So Carissa and Philip meet up with Pastor Stephen and they tell him, they're like, hey, Philip has been having an emotional and physical relationship with one of the women from church. And they talk about it, they sit, they pray together, Philip cries, and that's when Pastor Stephen tells him like, hey, you should probably resign from the church. And Philip was a little bit upset about this, but he knew that this was the right thing to do and agreed to do so because he had like royally failed at preaching the gospel, right? He, he really messed up when it came to his job. So Philip agreed. He quit his job. He started going to marriage counseling with Carissa every week. They would go every Thursday. And he also agreed to stop watching the prawn because he admitted himself like in that session with Pastor Steven that he had a real issue with it. So they even went as far as putting a filter on the computer so he wouldn't have access to the prawn or the escort services um, to kind of take the temptation away since he said, you know, I got an issue with that. And apparently like Carissa wanted this, of course, because like he's been cheating on her. But on top of that, it wasn't just her. Pastor Steven insisted that this filter be put on the computer and said that if they didn't do it, he wouldn't have continued like counseling them as a couple. Like this was something that he was adamant about. So where we are now is Philip has stopped his affair, started marriage counseling, was reconnecting with his wife, has quit his job as a pastor and got a new job as a nurse and a manager at O'Neill Retirement Home, where he was in charge of distributing and disposing of medications. But here's the thing he didn't actually stop his affair. He just proceeded to hide it a little bit better so that maybe Carissa wouldn't find out about it. And him and Eileen would continue to liaison in his car. But Carissa wasn't dumb. Like a woman knows when there's something going on with, well, not all women. Oftentimes a woman knows when there's something going on with their husband. And she clearly had some feeling that something was happening because she confronted him on this during a session with Pastor Steven. And she did this in October of 2011, which was the month that she was killed. So now back to that day, October 17th, 2011, Philip makes a panic call to 911 saying that his wife is in the tub. She's not breathing and she's too slippery or wet to get out of the tub. Please show up. They find that she is submerged in water. And again, this nurse performed no life-saving measures on his wife, which, you know, hey, people go into shock. People react differently when it's somebody they know than they would if it was, you know, them in work mode, they're in like life mode. But there were some other things that might just make you go like, hmm. 
police question Philip and he tells them that on that night, the night that she, you know, his wife died in the bathtub, he had gone out and gone on a run for about an hour. But when they asked him where he had ran, he said that he couldn't remember. In searching the home, they don't find much, but one thing that they do find is they find a pillow on the bed that they believe belonged to Carissa. And on this pillow, there was vomit. Now, Carissa was taken to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. And when they performed an autopsy and, you know, checked her body, they found that there was a powerful sedative called lorazepam in her system. And this is also referred to as Ativan. And this drug causes drowsiness, dizziness, and sedation. But here's the thing. This drug was not prescribed to her, so why would she take it? And she was pregnant, so really, why would she take it? Philip was brought in for questioning about this, and police were suspicious of him, but they didn't have enough evidence to really do anything about it, so they had to just let him go. So that's already a little bit weird, right? But it does, there's more. Let's just keep going, there's more. So, the day after Carissa died, Pastor Philip met up at a Tim Hortons with Pastor Stephen, okay? And they were going over burial arrangements and they start talking about like burial plots and Pastor Stephen brings up the idea of like double burial plots so that you can be buried next to your spouse when you inevitably die as well. So he brings it up and he's surprised to find that Philip's kind of like cool about it. Like he's kind of not interested in getting a double plot with his wife. And when like Pastor Stephen's like, you don't want to be like buried with Carissa. He was like, you know, I don't know. I'm, I might get remarried one day. Now you may recall that this is pastor Steven, the same pastor who's been giving the couple, him and Carissa couples therapy. So he knows about their whole relationship. And he also knows about uh, Philip. That's his name being unfaithful in the relationship. So he asks him like straight up, like, so, Hey, are you still in love with Eileen? And Philip tells him, yeah. And the pastor at this point kind of gets snarky with him and is like, well, I guess everything worked out in your favor and you can like ride off into the sunset now, can't you? And this whole situation didn't sit quite right with Pastor Stephen. He thought that it was inappropriate and weird that Philip seemed more interested with his girlfriend, essentially, than his dead spouse. And he just felt like this is not the type of thing that he should be thinking about the day after his wife was, was accidentally dead. That was a weird way to put it, but you know what I'm saying? He thought that it was weird and the whole thing sat real off with him. Now from there, time went on. Chris's funeral took place two weeks after she was killed and this took place at the Jarvis Baptist Church. And in her find a grave, Philip was actually described as a loving husband and they a loving couple. Six months went by with people having no real idea what was going on, not even sure if this was a murder or an accidental death. But then in May of 2012, police came and they arrested Philip in connection with Carissa's murder. Turns out that during these six months where it seemed like nothing was happening, police were really looking into Philip and they came to the conclusion that Philip had intentionally drugged his wife with the plan to kill her. So he was arrested. He was charged with first degree murder and he was given bond. It was $305,000 and he did post bond and he was released um, to his parents' house where he had to stay on house arrest and he wasn't able to leave their house unless he was accompanied by his mother or his father. And that's where he stayed while he awaited trial. As I'm sure you can imagine, people were completely shocked to see that Philip was arrested for this. A neighbor named Linda came out and spoke to reporters saying that it just seemed completely unbelievable that Philip could be responsible for Carissa's death. She said in the time that she had been neighbors with the Grandines, which was two years, they had gotten to be pretty close. They would come over to her house in the summers and have lemonade. And she spent time with them on Philip's birthday, even meeting like their friends and their family. And I guess when they got pregnant, they like went over to her house to tell her about the pregnancy and like they joked about how their life was about to change forever. And she said that she just cannot believe that he would do something like that. They were so nice. They seemed so happy together and that she couldn't imagine what Chris's family was going through at that time and really, really hoped that Philip was innocent because the alternative was just too hard for people to even imagine. The new pastor who took over for Pastor Philip, this was Pastor Jesse, said that the congregation was really taking it super hard, like that Philip was arrested for this. And then he, she, they, can a pastor be a woman? I don't know. They said of this, quote, they're shocked trying to come to grips with the whole thing. It's tough as well. These are at this point allegations and we want justice to be served one way or the other. We want the truth to come out. So now let's talk about what they found during their investigation. 
Basically, what police believe happened is that Philip drugged his wife and then placed her in the bathtub so that she would die, either pushing her head under the water or just letting her slip under the water and not helping her at all when she was unconscious because he wanted to be able to do whatever he wanted. He wanted to be able to continue with his affair, to do the escort services, to watch his prod, to do whatever he wanted without having any baggage from his wife. He wanted to have his cake and eat it too. Whatever that means, because I've never understood that phrase, but that's what we're saying here. First, they found out that Philip had lied to them, like that Philip had lied to police, because you remember he said he was like out on a run at the time that Carissa died. Well, it turns out lie detector determined that was a lie. He was actually home and he was on the phone with Eileen. He was on the phone with Eileen and he was on the computer looking up his prawn sites, okay, and looking up escort service sites. And you might be thinking to yourself when you hear that, but wait a minute, what about the filter? Because remember, a filter was put on the, the computer based on Carissa's recommendation and also the insistence of Pastor Steven. Well, turns out 40 minutes before Philip called emergency services and reported that his wife was unresponsive, he had removed the filter from the computer. So he's on the computer looking up whatever he wants. And at the same time, he's on the phone talking to Eileen. And I guess he called Eileen and she texts back. And then two minutes later, he called her again. And then the two talked on the phone for 30 minutes. And then he hangs up the phone. And three minutes later, he calls 911. Now, speaking of computers, because this matters, they found in looking into the home computer that someone had been making some very interesting Google searches as well. They've been searching words like autopsy, lorazepam, toxicology, and phrases like, would 100 milligrams of Ativan be fatal? Other things were also found on the computers like memory, including word combinations like benzodias and autopsy and lorazepam and toxicology. So somebody was looking up some really sketchy stuff considering how Carissa died. So that doesn't look good, right? But another thing that doesn't look good is that while all of this is going on, he's still banging his mistress. He's supposed to be in mourning. He's supposed to be mourning the death of his wife and of his unborn baby. He's supposed to be planning her funeral, but he's still hooking up with Eileen. And you know, maybe that's not criminal, right? But it definitely makes him look like a dick. So back to what police believe. Police believe that Philip had stolen the drugs that he used to incapacitate his wife from his job. Because you remember he worked at that, that he was a nurse <laughs> and he was the one that was in charge of distributing and like discarding medications, right? So they believe that he took the medications from work. He came home and he used them to spike her smoothie. So he would make her a smoothie. She would drink it and she would get sick. And he believed that he had tested this on himself to see how the effects would affect him. And he had tested it on Carissa to see like what her effects looked like. So he knew like how to proceed, right? Okay. There's evidence though. Let me get to it. So police spoke to Pastor Stephen and Pastor Stephen told them about a weird encounter he had had with Philip during one of their sessions. This was a session that was not long before Carissa was killed. And he said during this session, Philip seemed super weird, super out of it. He was super groggy. He was slurring his words. He wasn't able to stay awake. Pastor Stephen said it was clear to him that Philip was on something at the time, but of course at the time he had no idea that this was going to happen. So he didn't, you know, hindsight being 2020, he connected it and believed that he might have been using those drugs in himself. And this was just a day before Carissa would end up in the hospital because of allegedly being poisoned as well. Now it's believed the reason that Carissa ended up in the hospital on this day is because Philip had tried these drugs out on her. So basically what happened is this was on October 14th, 2011. So just days before she would be killed. Philip made Carissa a banana smoothie. She drank it and shortly after drinking it, she had to be rushed to the hospital by Philip. She was showing symptoms of dizziness, sedation, impaired muscle control, and disorientation. And these, all these symptoms lasted in her for more than 12 hours. This was super scary for Carissa because she was said to have been very cautious in her pregnancy and she was worried that something could be wrong with her. Something could be wrong with her baby. Even her mother and sister came and met her at the hospital and she talked to them and told them that she was like super scared. She was super worried because she felt so awful and she couldn't figure out why she felt so awful, like what the cause of this could be. And she told them that she had just been growing up like nonstop, that she had thrown up like 11 or 12 times until there was just nothing left even in her stomach. And then as if that's not bad enough. And this part gave me goosebumps and made me feel so uncomfortable. And it's something that really put her family on edge then, and especially put them on edge 
after Carissa died. Apparently, while in the hospital, Carissa turned to Philip and asked him, quote, Philip, did you give me a pill? And I guess this question really caught him off guard because he kind of like stopped in his tracks, not really sure what to say, it seemed like, and then just simply answered no. Isn't that so just scary when I heard that I was like the fact that she even asked him that I would never ever ever if I was feeling sick I would never ask my husband if he gave me a pill I would never suspect that he would do that you know what I mean and the fact that she did is so horrifying but her blood was drawn that night and when the blood was tested it showed that Ativan was in her system which is the same drug that was in her system the day that she died now, I guess during her time at the hospital during this trip, it was very tense and very like awkward and uncomfortable. I guess Philip seemed weird. He seemed distant. He seemed antsy. He seemed like he didn't want to be there, like he wanted to leave. And it was very apparent to Carissa and her family. It was so apparent that Carissa actually snapped at him. She like was like, what? Do you got somewhere to be? You want to go home? You have somebody waiting there for you? Like it was clear that she could tell he didn't want to be there. And this was a very tense moment and it seemed like they were about to fight but then luckily well not like i don't know if it's luckily i don't know what the situation was but it got cooled off because a doctor came and took her to go and do her cat scan so that they could see you know what could be the cause of why she was feeling the way she was so carissa underwent several tests that night for them to try to figure out what was wrong with her but ultimately she just got sent home because her symptoms started to go away and she started to feel better now, it turns out that Carissa's family, her mother, her sister, told police about this whole situation, like, right away. As soon as she died, they were like, yo, this happened. We were in the hospital. She seemed like she was drugged. She had no idea how it would have happened. And she even asked her husband if he had given her a pill. And this was really compelling to police because they brought this information to the police before they had even figured out that she had been drugged. They just knew that she had drowned. So they were giving them information that they didn't know yet that turned out to be true. You know what I mean though? Like this was information that wasn't influenced by something they learned. It's not like they learned that she was drugged and then later were like, oh, you know, da, 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 you know, cause that can't happen. You can be influenced. This was independent of knowing that they just came forward with it. So that's very important. All right, now let's get into the trial. Well, the first trial, because this is where everything gets really Fucky. As I'm sure you can imagine, Philip pled not guilty and they were going after him for first degree murder because they believed that he had intentionally drugged his wife to kill her. And the state or the crown, the crown, Canada crown, presented the case that I've told you about so far. They brought up the fact that Carissa had drugs in her system and that she would have no reason to have taken those drugs herself and that she just never would have done that. They said that there was no evidence that she was ever in the mindset of wanting to like hurt herself or take drugs herself and that she had been super cautious and super careful through her entire pregnancy. Like there's no way that she would put her baby at risk. And then they presented the theory that it was Philip who had given her the drugs. And they also brought up a family doctor, like the family doctor to tell them that like nobody in the home was prescribed lorazepam. And the, the crown was basically like, listen, Carissa had no reason at all to take this particular drug, but Philip had plenty of reasons to want to give it to her. They also talked about the computer searches, you know, about the same drugs in Chris's system and the autopsy, the toxicology, all that that was searched. And it turns out that it was Philip's Wiki Answers account that was used to search those things. And those searches were happening right around the same time that other searches were happening on the computer for porn and escort services. To counter these things, his attorneys brought up the fact that there didn't seem to be any drugs missing from his work, not from the actual facility, like the logs that they kept, or from any of the residents at the, you know, the place where he worked. I forgot what it was called. My brain turned off. And they also tried to say that it was Carissa herself who took the drugs and that she was the one who made like those computer searches as well. And that she was trying to self-medicate because she was unhappy at the state of her life with everything that had been going on with her husband's affair and things like that. And the way they tried to strengthen this was by saying that at the same time the searches were happening, Carissa's Facebook page was also active, which I feel like the Google searches for like the escort services and the porn are more compelling than like a Facebook being active because some people just like leave their social media logged in. So that didn't feel quite as compelling to me personally. Another thing that was discussed at the trial was the filter that had been on the computer that was removed from the computer right around the time that Carissa would have been 
dying. The prosecution, the crown, I keep saying prosecution because I'm from America, but the crown was basically like, listen, he removed this filter from the computer because he was certain that his wife wasn't going to be there to object to it being removed, right? Like that alone shows his intent to kill her. But then the defense was like, well, no, he isn't the one who removed it. Carissa removed it herself because she didn't want him to be burdened with the fact that it was there after she took her own life and basically said that like Philip could not have been the one to remove it because he didn't have access to the account. He wasn't like one of the administrators in the account. And then the crown was like, well, he could have used his wife's email and like got the password and took it off himself. So they kind of went back and forth on that one a bit. Now the idea that Carissa was the one that removed it because she was going to take her own life and didn't want him to be burdened with it being on the computer after she was gone is like, a creative thing. I'll give the defense that it's like a creative way to try to explain that, but it didn't make a lot of sense because the couple's computer was kept in the basement. So basically they're saying that she was like, this is all happening while he's in the house, mind you, that she's intoxicated enough that she can go down to the basement, do this, but somehow then be court, like be coordinated enough, excuse me, to go down to the basement and do this, then be intoxicated enough to go back upstairs, get in the tub, and drown. You know what I mean? Like it just didn't, the math wasn't really math in there. In court, they talked about Eileen and how, you know, this, him being with her was sort of a motive for him. And they talked about just how often Philip and Eileen talked to each other, because I guess in the months leading up to Chris's death, Eileen and Philip texted like thousands of times. And even on the day that Carissa died, they sent like 300 text messages back and forth. They also had Eileen testify herself and her testimony was definitely super compelling. She told the court all about their affair and how they were banging for a while and they kept doing it after Carissa died for months, like until January of 2012, they were still sleeping with each other. She told them about how often they talked and how even while his wife was like in the hospital, not feeling well, the two of them were talking. And she said that he often joked about the two running away together so that they could just be together. But she did say that he never did talk about harming his wife. But one thing she said that really stuck out to me is she told the court that Philip asked her if he should even go to his dead wife's funeral. I know. Let's let that sink in and then let's just move past it. The prosecutor basically told the court that Philip could be found guilty of two crimes, stealing the drugs to give Carissa and also giving them to her resulting in her death. They said that the case was mostly circumstantial, but that the circumstantial evidence was overwhelming. And they believed again that he had taken the drugs. He had spiked her smoothie. He had given it to her to incapacitate her and then put her in the bathtub so that she could just die. And as far as the defense, they said that they believed that Carissa had done this to herself, either by accident or on purpose. And as far as Philip went, he did not testify at this trial. Now, even though the crown was going after a first degree murder conviction, the jury was having trouble coming to a conclusion. Like all of them weren't able to agree that he had willfully killed Carissa. So they weren't able to get him like, like they weren't able to get a conviction on that charge. Right. But that's not to say that he wasn't found guilty at all. He did end up being found guilty of manslaughter. So he was responsible for her death. They just didn't believe that he, they couldn't come to the conclusion that he had done it on purpose. So he was found guilty of manslaughter and he was given 15 years for this crime. The judge said that this was as close to a murder as a manslaughter case could get and that the drugging wasn't like an all of a sudden thing. He had researched and planned this. He had stolen the drugs and tested them on him and her and then killed her. And the judge said of this quote, his behavior was diabolical and violent. It was planned and premeditated and took place not just on the night of her death, but days before when he experimented with the lorazepam on her and on himself to see what the effects of the drugs would be. Carissa's sister Hannah gave a statement alongside her mother at the time that his, you know, guilty verdict was read. And she said of this quote, Carissa was truly a kind and generous person. She has been and will continue to be sorely missed. We know that God is in control of the situation and we are ever grateful for everyone's thoughts and prayers. And as for Philip, he spoke like through his attorney, his attorney came out and said that he and his family were absorbing the events of the day and that they were satisfied with the fact that the jury had not believed that he intended to kill his wife, but they weren't happy with the sentence that he was given because apparently in Canada, similar crimes were given a sentence of closer to five to seven years. So he believed that the 15 was excessive. 
Now it's super weird here and kind of random, but I'm still gonna tell you about is that Canadian Parliament ended up using this case, like this sentencing as an example. Like basically they were saying that because his sentence was so severe, 15 years, um, this was showing that a woman's pregnancy could be used as like an aggravating factor in a case to get a harsher punishment. And I was like, that's very interesting that you think that 15 years is like a super harsh punishment for killing somebody and a baby, but go off. But anyways, back to Philip. Now, as I'm sure you will not be surprised, Philip did appeal his conviction as they always do. But something that may actually surprise you is that his appeal was successful. Basically what happened here is the trial judge like fucked up a little bit. So they went through the entire trial. They both sides presented their side. And then at the end, the judge threw out like a totally new theory about what could have happened to Carissa. And if the jury believed that this thing had happened to Carissa, they could have found him guilty of manslaughter. Right. And it wasn't good because this was like not an angle that either side had been arguing. So therefore neither side had a chance to like, disputed at all. Like the defense wasn't able to try to like say anything about this because it never came up at trial. The judge essentially said that if the jury believed that Philip knew that Carissa was on drugs, whether he was the person who gave them to her or not, if he knew she was on him and allowed her to get into the bathtub, he could be guilty of manslaughter because he did not attempt to save her from herself. This essentially meant that the jury did not have to believe that he gave her the drugs for him to be guilty. He just had to know that she had taken them because he had seen how they had affected her in the past. And if he knew she was intoxicated and stop her from getting in the tub, then he could be guilty of her dying. Even if he didn't give her the drugs himself. Do you know what I mean? And again, this was an issue because it wasn't presented earlier at trial. So the defense didn't have a chance to respond to it at all, which in turn, quote, materially compromised the fairness of the trial, end quote. So he was released on bail while he awaited his new trial. And the judge who like allowed him to get out on bail said that they acknowledged that this was going to be very difficult for Carissa's family and for those who loved Carissa, but said that they were sure that the quote administration of justice would not be undermined by the appellant's release end quote, pending the new trial. So he was out on bail for years before he would go to trial again. Years. Can you even imagine how hard this was on Carissa's family? Years, man. Her mother said of this quote, the reopening of my daughter's case continues to make the wound of losing her so palpable and raw again and again, considering that the person who she thought would have loved her and protected her being her husband has in the end betrayed her. Now, when the second trial finally took place, the prosecution went a whole new route like their, their strategy was totally different for whatever reason. They were not able to say that Philip intended to kill his wife. They weren't able to say it and they weren't able to like show evidence that would suggest that at all. On top of that, the new jury was aware that he had had a trial before and had been convicted, but they weren't able to know like the outcome of that trial or why he was given a new trial. With that, Philip was this time charged with manslaughter, not murder. And again, he pled not guilty. The defense pretty much had the same argument. They had two angles that they were going with. One was that she had taken the drugs herself because she was suicidal over the condition of her marriage and the fact that her husband was cheating on her. But nobody really bought this because she was like a deeply religious woman who wouldn't take her own life and wouldn't like put the life of her baby in jeopardy. But the other angle they were going after was that this could have been an accident. They suggested that she could have been self-medicating, but not trying to kill herself, that she was just depressed and she didn't want to feel so much. So she took these drugs and that she could have accidentally drowned. And they tried to say that this happened because she did have evidence, which I haven't even mentioned yet, but she did have evidence of blunt force trauma on her head. And it wasn't an injury that would have been bad enough to kill her, but it's something that could have knocked her out. So they were basically saying that she got in the tub because she had taken some drugs. She had like slipped because it was slippery. It was wet. She was intoxicated. She hit her head, passed out, and then accidentally drowned. But it's also been said that she could have gotten this head injury because Philip was quote, trying to get her out of the water and that he was he was trying to get her out of the water. She may have hit her head at that point, because she kept slipping. Because if you recall, he was told to take Carissa out of the tub and put her on the floor on her left side. But he said he couldn't do it because she was too heavy and too slippery. So they think that it's possible that she could have gotten that head injury at that time as well. 
the prosecution basically went with what the judge had said last time, but this time, you know, argued it at trial so that it would have to be addressed. They said that it was Philip's duty to protect his wife. And even if he was not the person to give her the drugs, he knew how they had affected her. He had seen her at the hospital and seen how they had affected her previously. And there was no way that he could have been in that house and not seen how intoxicated she was from the drugs, even if he wasn't the one who gave them to her, and even if he was the one who gave them to her, but hadn't intended to kill her, that he could still be responsible for not protecting her from herself. But the prosecution definitely seemed to believe that he was the one who gave her the drugs, even if he hadn't intended to kill her. And the prosecution said of this quote, Chris Grandine died because she had been unknowingly sedated. She was drugged without her knowledge or permission. She was drugged against her will. And in that sedated state, she drowned in the bathtub. Even though Philip Grandine didn't intend her death, he was nonetheless responsible for her death. When the jury was sent to deliberate and they were given their instructions, they were told in order to find Philip guilty of manslaughter, they had to determine that he had contributed, contributed, that was weird, contributed significantly to his wife's death, even if they didn't believe that he was like the main cause of it. Ultimately, Philip Grandine was found guilty of manslaughter for a second time, and he showed no emotion when the verdict was read. Carissa's sister Hannah cried as the judge told Philip that his actions, quote, reached a depth of depravity that begs the imagination of any right thinking person. After the ruling, Carissa's mom said that Philip wasn't sorry. She said, quote, as a mother, I cannot express the devastation and anguish that was brought about by this terrible act of violence. The horrendous actions of Mr. Philip Grandine have cost my daughter and grandchild their lives. He disgraced the nursing profession, betrayed his vows, and shattered our hopes. The family then were able to give their victim impact statements. They stood there all holding photos of Carissa, and 33 people gave impact statements about how the loss of Carissa had affected their lives. Carissa's mother said that when she first heard her daughter was dead, she just didn't believe it. And then she slowly had to come to terms with the fact that she was dead and then had to come to terms with the fact that Philip was responsible and said that she felt a tremendous amount of resentment and blame, not just towards Philip, but also towards herself. And she said of this quote, I vividly remember the very shocking news of Carissa's death being found in the bathtub. I felt the world had caved in on me. What did he do to try and save her? How long was she in the bathtub lifeless? Did she suffer long? What about the baby? All these ran through my mind. I felt angry at myself for not being there and a sense of betrayal for Philip as her husband and not being able to save her. She also told the court that she had spoken to her daughter just hours before she died and that it was a totally normal conversation and that before getting off the phone, her daughter said to her like, I love you, mom. And she was like, how was I supposed to know? How was I supposed to know that was going to be the last time I ever heard her voice? She said that she visits her daughter's grave and she sings hymns to her grandchild, a grandchild that she never got a chance to meet. And at the time that this all took place, Carissa would have been 37, which would have made Maria's granddaughter seven years old. And she said that there needed, there like had to be punishment for the lawlessness that was committed against her child and her grandchild and said that Carissa cries out for justice from her grave. Carissa's father, Roman, was still in the Philippines. He did give a victim impact statement, but it was read by like the Crown's attorney. And in the statement, he said that he too is just irrevocably changed since his daughter's murder. He said specifically of this quote, her death forever left me in a big broken heart. I cannot accept it until now. I am seriously traumatized and forever worried about the safety of my younger children. And that's just incredibly sad, man. When I think about her dad, because, okay, here's what happened with her dad. It's absolutely crazy. So he lived in the Philippines. And years earlier, when the first trial was going on, he was flying from the Philippines to Canada so that he could be there. And during the flight, he got super dizzy and lightheaded and almost passed out. And then during a layover, his blood pressure was, like, checked. And it was, like, so high that he had to be hospitalized and they wanted to keep him there. But he insisted that they let him leave because he had to get to his daughter's funeral. And he found out later that he had suffered two strokes that day. Isn't that crazy? It's just absolutely crazy. And it just shows 
that this kind of thing affects more than just the person that you're killing. Uh, Carissa's cousin Anthony said it best when he said that her murder was outright evil. Everyone spoke out against Philip, dude. Like, everyone was affected. Uh, the leaders of the church were, like, devastated to find out that he had actually done this. Like, can you imagine working with somebody, especially if that's your job and finding this out, how devastating that would be? Like, there was a deacon, Deacon Robert, said that, like, he was ashamed for not noticing the despicable things that Pastor Philip was doing and was capable of. He also said that Philip doing this has stolen his trust and his faith in people. And he said that's because, quote, if a pastor can betray you, who can you trust? Another church leader, this was a church leader named Cliff, who had known Carissa since she was a child, said losing her had left a hole in their community. And he said specifically of this, quote, we lost a giver, not a taker. Someone who loved life, her family, and that child to be. Now we must honor the memory of her. Ultimately, again, the judge sentenced Philip Grandine to 15 years in prison. It's just like a complete copy paste from the last trial. It's kind of crazy. The same sentence, the same verdict, like everything was the same. And it's just, I found that to be very, very strange. But the judge said that even though it couldn't be proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Philip had been planning to kill Carissa the night that he killed her, the judge said that they had no doubt that he would have killed his wife one day. They stated that the crime was diabolical, callous, premeditated, and planned, and said that Carissa had no idea what her husband was capable of. And the judge stated that Carissa was experiencing domestic abuse and stated that domestic abuse can both be physical and emotional. The judge said specifically of this, quote, In committing this offense, Grandine did perpetrate a form of emotional and physical violence on his wife. She had no idea what was being done to her. She could not have avoided the assault. She could not see the weapon used against her. The judge then stated that Carissa was a kind, generous, and considerate person that was beloved by every single person, but the person who was supposed to love her most. And then added that if he was so unhappy, he could have just left her. Philip did not react when the verdict was read, when the sentencing was read. He didn't react while Carissa's mother poured her eyes out on the stand through the entire trial. He just sat stone-faced. Now, this is going to blow your mind a little bit or a lot of it. After finally getting justice again, after finally him being found guilty, him being sentenced again, I believe this was in 2020, just hours after his sentence was read, his attorney was in the courthouse requesting that his client be let out of jail again because they were going to appeal again. The prosecution objected to this bail request, of course, saying that his grounds for appeal were insubstantial and said that the general public, not just Chris's friends and family, were outspoken in their opposition against Philip's release. Despite the great outrage, Philip was released again on bail while he waited for his second conviction to be appealed. He was let out again. Carissa's family was devastated. Her sister was very outspoken in how she was outraged. She was angry. She was sad. She said that her family had come to the come to Canada from the Philippines for a better life and that their experience with the justice, justice system there has just been like completely eye-opening and surprising. And she basically said like, how are we supposed to trust in any system that gives a convicted murderer this much power? You remember Cliff, that church leader? Well, he was outspoken with his distaste for this decision and said that it's like a very sad day for the family because they have to go through all of this again. He added that the family gets no closure while this monster gets to play the system and said that basically they're treating the victim like the criminal and the criminal like a victim. So he was out waiting for his appeal and his appeal raised a few issues like the fact that he thought the judge should, should have like excluded certain evidence like certain computer searches and also said that the that he believed that his sentencing of 15 years was excessive. In the end, the Court of Appeals rejected Philip's second appeal, saying that they didn't have any grounds to interfere with the sentencing and that the amount of time he was given was fit and reasonable. They also said that the determination of the court was correct, saying that Philip had general and specific knowledge of his wife's risks in ingesting the drugs that were in her system, both because he had seen how they affected her specifically and because of his job as a nurse, he saw how they affected people generally. It was his duty to intervene and to save her. 
Now that was in 2022. So I have to assume he's back in jail by now. I could not find a single article that expressed that specifically. But I mean, with that much time, I have to imagine he is. If you are local and you know, please put it in the comments for us so I can like pin it so that we can see it. But I have to assume he's back in jail now. Her family now has the opportunity to try to heal now that they finally can be rest assured that justice has been served for Carissa, you know? Like they literally had to wait, what, like almost 10 years? He got six years off after the first trial waiting on that appeal and then another two years. It's absolutely wild that he was able to get that much free time out of jail, especially considering there were two trials, two convictions, two appeals. It's ridiculous. They said that Carissa was at her most vulnerable being, you know, five months pregnant and she was experiencing domestic abuse. And they said that the court needs to continue sh like showing an example of how these sorts of cases are going to be dealt with. Let people know that they're not going to get away with abusing their, their pregnant wives, mothers, sisters, like pregnant women are going to be protected. Carissa's sister, Hannah said of the appeals rejection. And I quote, we are heartened to know that he will finally be in custody for a crime he was convicted of. Not once, but twice. And with that, that my friends is the story of the death of Carissa Grandine. I hope you found this to be informative and that it made sense and that I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Carissa with me today. Now, considering everything I've told you throughout this video, because I know it's been like a lot, a lot of back and forth, a lot of information, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that is this. Do you believe that Philip is responsible for the death of his pregnant wife? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below, because I do feel like this is the type of case that could be divisive. And I'd love to see what you guys think about this. But anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to let me know what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases and whenever you leave a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys are interested in because they're often cases that I haven't heard of or need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. Before you go, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my membership, where you can get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. And now I just want to say one last thank you to Dossier for partnering with me on today's video. It's sponsors like Dossier that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And I want to thank you guys for always, for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.